I mean, it's all economic. Uh, back then, uh, today, less than 1% of the country feeds the other 99%. Back then, 80 to 90% of the country provided their own food, their own substance. And back then, even farms that started to transition when the population started to go to the cities and all, uh, had their own substance things that it did, their chickens, their cows, you know, and their, their vegetables that they raised. But sugarcane came to Terrebonne Parish as a cash crop, something that you could actually sell and make some money to help pay for things because labor was cheap. People worked on the farms just for room and board. You know, that's, that's how, how it, just how it was back then. And, uh, and so sugarcane became a cash crop for the area where people could get actual money for their product instead of just eating it. <laughs> go back 200 plus years ago, a little before Terrebonne uh, was really settled, and uh, a man named Entienne de Boré, he actually invented the process of crystallization of sugar in what is now Audubon Park. Yeah, and that was where they first, the sugar industry started in Louisiana. Now it's one of the biggest industries worldwide. Um, show you how big the industry is worldwide. In Louisiana, we have 11 sugar mills, and we think that's a lot. In Brazil, they have 300, which is incredible. Brazil is the largest producer of sugar in the world, but they export sugar and they make half, half of their crop goes to ethanol. And so their energy self-sufficient through that. So, um, so sugar started and basically we had South, they had numerous, at one time, Louisiana had 600 plus little bitty sugar mills throughout the state. And then they started to grow. Actually, the Montague Sugar Mill, which was last owned by the South Coast Corporation, uh, was one of the world's, if not the world's largest sugar mill at one time in the world, which is incredible. It is it, since back in the, I don't know if it's the 70s or 80s, uh, torn down and sent to Guatemala, where it's currently running, from what I'm told. And then South Bent Down left. And I mean, you can look at all of the you know, South Down, uh, all, all of the communities around here, down 311 and everything, used to all be sugarcane fields. So it was dominant in its day. My great, let's see, great great grandfather settled here in 1853, you know, and uh, he was actually a son of Joseph Ellender. And they kind of changed the name back then. It was, there's debate whether it was Ellender or Elinger, E-L-I-N-G-E-R, it was German, Elinger. And uh, there was a huge German settlement down here too. And I mean, most of it stayed in the New Orleans area, but a lot of them came down here. As a matter of fact, my dad told stories about how, you know, today we sit around the TV and spend our evenings. Back then they used to sit around campfires and tell stories. And he'd say there were people that would tell sentences of stories and use English, German, and French all in one sentence, <laughs> you know, can you imagine <laughs> that today? It, it just doesn't happen. But, uh, but my great, great grandfather was only, his father actually passed away before he was born. And then he moved to Donisonville, married a lady who, uh, whose father was in the sugar men business, came down here in 1853. So we've been doing this since 1853 in my family. And how big they were, I don't, I don't know. You know. They had acres down in Berg, Montague, that they s settled and uh, bought land from different companies and all. All I can tell you is I know when my dad started farming with my grandfather, they had 150 acres of land that they farmed and probably two dozen employees. Uh, when I started farming with my dad, my dad had built it up to 1,500 acres and you know, we probably still had, you know, at least 15 or 20 employees. Today, my brother, my nephew, and my son and I form four, over 4,000 acres, and we don't even have a dozen employees, you know. And that leads to another subject you talked about is mechanization, you know. Uh, back in the day, I remember stories of my grandfather being at a uh, uh, cash crop and transportation not being what it was today, 
most of the stuff was done down the bayous where a mule would pull a barge down to the sugar mill in Montague. And my grandfather's, I don't know if it was my great grandfather or my grandfather, they used to cut five tons of sugar cane every other day for a load to go down to the Montague sugar mill. And it was all done by hand, you know, loaded by hand into a barge, pulled to the, to the sugar mill by mules. And today, we can cut five tons with a combine in about less than five minutes. So, so you know, me mechanization has definitely just progressed immensely through the years. Back, ironically, I just a few nights ago, went to the 100th anniversary of the American Sugarcane League. Now, the American Sugarcane League is the commodity organization that oversees all of the mills in Louisiana and uh, all of its sugarcane farmers. Now, uh, it's we have a board of directors, half of them are sugar mill people, half of them are sugar growers. It started in 1922 because of a mosaic disease that hit the sugar industry. It decimated the industry. It, it brought it down, I don't know how much, but I'm saying less than half of the production because of this one disease called mosaic. Well, the uh, Sugar League was formed back then, and they were able to get rid of this disease through breeding, plant breeding. And the, the facility we have here in Oklahoma started it. So, and, it, and it's, it's interesting. I just found out that uh, a guy named, he was Representative Alan Ellender from uh, Terrebonne Parish at the time, state representative, I actually presented a bill before the state legislature for back then $25,000, which was probably a huge amount of money. And it started that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it political. Uh, you know, there's always, you know, we're not, I have never received a government check for my crop. People think that we're a subsidized industry. We're not, we, it's based on supply and demand, but they're always, the sugar program kind of, I want to say, protects us from foreign countries just dumping sugar on our market. And, and that's our role in D.C. The Sugar League, actually, half of its job is, you know, political and the other half is totally um, uh, research, you know, which involves USDA. It involves the, you know, there's the Alderman Sugar Institute for the forest and all. And uh, it actually, you know, provides that. And um, so there's that challenge of political and just different crops. We, I mean, hurricanes. Hurricanes is a major, I mean, this past Ida was the worst storm that we ever had. You know, in, in the past, we didn't have it. But fortunately, now, as farmers, we buy crop insurance. We, and I even, Thank you, Lord. I bought hurricane insurance this last year, which greatly helped me because I don't know how I could have made it without it, you know. So uh, stuff like that, you know, and that, that's, you know, we talk about mechanization and tools. This crop insurance and hurricane insurance helped me as much as any technology could have, you know. Oh, goodness. You know, uh, back when uh, uh, Deborah and all first granulated sugar, and this tells you how, you know, they produced Audubon, where we know as Audubon Park now was the first plantation, and I forget how many acres they did, but they got roughly 10 cents a pound for their sugar, which in inflationary dollars today would probably be dollars a pound. You know, when I first started farming with my dad, we were only getting 15 cents, and that wasn't too many years ago. And uh, the price of sugar has just gone up over the last few years. It, currently, it's sitting less than 30 cents a pound, or right at 30 cents a pound. But you know, for the first part of my career, all I was getting was 20 cents a pound. So to get 10 cents a pound back then was an in, you know, incredible amount of money. And that was kind of one of the spearheads of the sugar industry worldwide to see what you could do with stuff like that. Uh, you know, on the cost side, Jerry mentioned earlier about the cost of oil and gas and all, and 
Yeah, with inflation, it's probably not that much uh, increase. But with sugar, you know, I mean, I, I tell people that, you know, just a few years ago, I was getting 22 cents a pound. And when I started, I was getting 20 cents a pound. And that's like saying, take your paycheck 30 years ago and not have any pay increases. But what we've done is we have greatly increased our production through the Sugar League, uh, doing the research and all. Uh, in 1920s, when they first really started a lot of research on it, they were getting roughly 2,900 pounds of sugar per acre. Now we're, the state is averaging almost nine. So we've tripled our yields. Uh, and acreage statewide has stayed pretty stable in about the 400 to 450,000 acre range, whereas in Terrebonne Parish, we've dropped about a, a third of what we, uh, at our peak, I would think. I think we're less than 10,000 acres now, by at least. And uh, at one time, we were 25 plus thousand acres of sugarcane. But we're probably still pr producing the same amount of sugar on that we're producing more sugar on those lesser acres right now than we did before. But can we keep it up? Who knows? We have to to survive because the price didn't increase relative to you know our cost. So our production increases has kept us in business. And this is really nationwide. Urban sprawl has taken over. Uh, you can look at Terrebonne Parish, you can look at Summerfield, South Down West, Highway 311, uh, Montague, you know, a lot of the lands down there uh, where it used to be sugarcane fields or not. Uh, I don't see agriculture playing a great role because of what we call urban sprawl, people moving out to the country. And it, it's just happening, but unfortunately it's happened nationwide. And it's a concern of a lot of farmers because, uh, you know, I heard one figure the other day that the average age of a farmer is 68 years old. That's scary, you know, knowing that all of our eggs are in this 1% of the country's basket or less than 1% of the country's basket at that age. Now, there are some young, great farmers coming up, uh, but they're having to, instead of buying their dad's 100 acre farm at a, you know, decent price, but they're looking at thousands of acres and how do they do that? You know, it's, it's incredible. You know, the challenges for these young farmers today and, you know, and it's happening nationwide. It's, we see it in Terrebonne Parish. Uh, what's the future? I see a little diversity, you know, you know, I've been to meetings and all where, you know, even with sugarcane, we, we can produce anything from plastics to ethanol to sugar, but, Sugar is still the, you know, I mentioned Brazil earlier. Brazil's half of their crop is uh, is ethanol, and so I don't see a great economic advantage there unless the price of oil and gas would greatly increase. And there was a move once to put an ethanol factory right there in Raceland, and and that was when the uh, price of oil and gas had skyrocketed, and, and it would have been worth it then, but at today's price of oil and gas and the price of sugar, it's not, so. Every year we have a molasses, people don't realize we produce a lot of molasses from sugar. Uh, they, when you go to a sugar mill, they, they try to get, they get 99 point plus, you know, percent out of the sugar. It's just a high grade raw sugar. It's like sugar in the raw. And then of the 11 sugar mills all send their raw sugar to either Domino, where my sugar goes, or um, I'm trying to think of his name. Anyhow, uh, LSR, and, and it's a cargo plant. And they'll take the raw sugar and turn it into white sugar, your table sugar, your confection of sugar, you know, you know, just everything. But sugar in the raw is basically sugar with still some molasses left over and uh, molasses uh, is a byproduct, so we get payment of that. Uh, bagasse, which is the pulp from the sugar cane, is actually used for the most part to power the sugar mills. They burn the bagasse 
to burn, to fuel the steam engines that run the sugar mills. So they're somewhat, you know, they still have to buy some electricity and all, but they're somewhat self-efficient. Now, there have been a lot of people who've, and there was a little project in racing in there again, too, where they were making these pelletized briquettes of bagasse that we were thinking of selling to, to Europe because of, I guess, environmental, renewable energies, stuff like that. And that started, but then when the price of fuel came down, it stopped. So it's, it's all relative to whether the price of fuel and, you know, People, our, our population, this was up in the, up till the 1970s, we're producing, we're consuming almost 100 pounds of sugar per person per year. And you said, wow, that's a lot. And, and, it, and it was, today, uh, we're producing less than 60, probably less than 50 per person. So uh, as consumers, we're, we're consuming less sugar, but you can look at obesity sugar consumption levels and at, at one point in time, the obesity levels started going up, the sugar consumption started going down and a, a couple of things that were attributed to that. One, we're eating the two or 300 calories per day more besides sugar, you know, everybody is. And two, the HFCS is the high fructose from corn, so y'all remember New Coke back in the 70s? That entered the market at the same time. And I've seen chart after chart where sugar consumption down, obesity up, HFCS levels up, which are now going down significantly uh, nationwide. Um, so the average, uh, more interesting fact, average, like I say, farmer produces about 8,000 pounds of sugar per acre, you know, and, and that's, we produce enough sugar to, in Louisiana to feed a few states. <laughs> so, well, we, we consume over 8,000 pounds of sugar per acre, and uh, we produce that much. Uh, and we've had y yields in some crops that have gone as much as 14, but it's a matter of consistency, you know, trying to do that. This last year was horrible. We had a 60% crop, 60% of what we normally produce. Uh, and a lot of people want to blame it solely on Ida, <clears throat> but uh, this last year we had, in the spring, we had one of the latest freezes we ever had, which knocked, stopped our growth of the cane we had, and then the crop comes back. Uh, and, um, and then after that, all the way up into Ida, we actually had 100 inches of rain pre-Ida this year, or last year. And I mean, this area usually receives around 60, and then Ida kind of kicked us when we were down on the ground. So thank God for crop insurance. <laughs>